chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and tonight is the beginning of a two-episode special covering the newest story from Kevin David Anderson in his Midnight Men series. Several of these stories were featured in earlier seasons of this show, and I'm absolutely oozing with delight now that we have a new one. The two Midnight Men in question are Earl and Dale, a couple of burly southern truckers. When they're not hauling cargo, they're taking on side work of a different sort. You see, these two fine, yet unrefined, gentlemen are rather adept at handling the creatures of the night. Tonight's story sees them encountering a new adversary in a very unexpected place, a boarded-up blockbuster video. This tale is titled, Blood, Holes, and Videotape. Also, I'd like to give special thanks to voice actress Olivia Steele for this episode and the next. This story has a lot of different female characters, and Olivia did an amazing job giving them all personality. Thanks, Olivia. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Kevin David Anderson, I give you Blood, Holes, and Videotape, Part 1. Dale's outstretched hand had already grabbed the door's handle before he knew he was going in. He didn't know why he was going in, nor did he know why his knuckles were spotted crimson. He paused for a second and swiped at the dried speckles with his other hand, then came to the quick conclusion that the blood coloring his digits was not his. Finding red vein juice on his frame that was not his was nothing new, but not recalling where or who it had come from certainly was. 
He shrugged and figured it would come to him eventually, much like why he was standing in the doorway of a retail establishment in which he had no idea what kind of business it was. Before he could take in the place, a child, just a beer can shorter than his waist, rushed by holding a rectangular box and shouted, This one, Mom! The Care Bears movie! No, I can't watch Care Bears again! shouted an older male sibling following on the heels of his little sister and holding a box of his own. The GoBots movie just came out. He held the box up higher. Battle of the Rock Lords. Dale let the door close behind him and stood motionless, listening to the dispute continue loudly throughout the store. No, GoBots suck! The younger one shouted. Care Bears blow donkeys! was the retort. A familiar voice broke through the sibling rivalry and found its way to Dale. Unless you're going to weigh in on the GoBots versus Care Bears debate, you want to come over here and help me decide? Dale glanced to the right and standing a few aisles over spied Earl, or rather a fair amount of Earl. His chest and enormous head stuck up over the display cases that made up the aisles in the establishment. Dale turned and headed toward his friend as another conversation this one coming from the retail counter in the middle of the store, filtered into his ear. There's a late fee, sir. That's bullshit, said a man in cargo shorts and a salmon-colored Izod shirt. Although the cargo shorts were an everyday sight, Dale couldn't remember the last time he'd seen an Izod shirt. And were those penny loafers? The cashier narrowed her very familiar gaze. And you did not rewind. That is another fee. Look, your tape got stuck in my machine. I was lucky to get it out without doing damage to my VCR. I'll waive the late fee, but not the rewind fee. She pointed to the sticker on the tape. Please rewind. It's on every tape. Dale stepped into the aisle where Earl seemed to be in heavy contemplation. It took some doing, but he turned his gaze from the very attractive cashier to his considerably less attractive friend. Hey, Earl. The very large man, wearing his usual, jeans, boots, and a very overworked t-shirt, turned toward Dale, holding up two boxes. Gotta narrow down to these two for tonight. We got Flash Gordon or Die Hard. Dale rubbed his chin. Well, I do like me some Dale Arden. What month are we in? Earl raised an eyebrow. July. Way too early, Dale said. Put the Christmas movie back. Save it for the holidays. Good call. Earl returned Die Hard to its spot on the shelf. Melody Anderson it is, then. Dale started glancing around again. Customers seemed to run even with a number of the all-female staff who wore a very nostalgic blue polo shirt. Oh, hey, Earl said, reaching for another box. How about this? He held up Evil Dead's Army of Darkness. Dale shook his head. You know I don't like documentaries. Fair enough, Earl said and put Sam Raimi's trilogy capper back. Riddle me this, Dale said. Why are you and I in a video rental store picking out films like it's date night? Earl rubbed one of his chins. Been wondering that myself. He gestured to the logos on the shelves. Blockbuster video to be exact. Thought they went the way of the dodo and Zima. They did. So why are we in one? Earl said. Hell, I don't even know how I came to be here. Neither did Dale, but as he took in the familiar faces of the staff, he started to get a notion. I suspect one of us is dreaming. If I'm dreaming and you're in it, it's probably a nightmare, Earl said, chuckling to himself. Funny, Dale replied. Well, which one of us is dreaming? I'm pretty sure it's me, Dale said. Notice the staff? Yeah, I was wondering about that. I think I know most of them, Earl said. Earl might have, but not as well as Dale certainly did. The entire blockbuster staff was made up of celebrity women he had deeply admired over the years. Toward the front of the store, a very young, vibrant Nichelle Nichols was changing out a Wrath of Khan poster for aliens. A bit behind her, stocking the shelves was the beautiful Erin Gray her Cornell Wilma Deering skin-tight uniform peering out from below her blockbuster polo shirt. Earl peered over at Ms. Gray. 
Damn, what sci-fi show was she on? Buck Rogers. That's right, Earl said. And over there, the blonde. That's a Bond girl, ain't she? Dale nodded. Very first one, Ursula Andress as Honey Rider from Dr. No. She wasn't wearing the iconic bikini that resonated in most men's minds, but the thick seashell-colored belt and sheathed clam knife were present. Not exactly blockbuster issue, but Miss Andrus wore it well. Earl snapped his fingers. I know that one, behind the counter, arguing with the preppy. That's Susan Sarandon from, I'm guessing, White Palace? Good guess, Dale said, but I mostly reminisce about her from Bull Durham. Oh yeah, I see it now. Earl turned to Dale. So, we're clearly in your head, and as much as I appreciate you including me in your dreams, I gotta ask you. What? Earl pointed an aisle over and lowered his voice a bit. Is that Melissa McCarthy over there? Dale sighed. He'd hoped his friend, dream version or not, wouldn't notice her. Not that I need to explain myself to you, but Ms. McCarthy is very intelligent, darn right adorable, and funny as hell. No argument here, but why is she wearing an apron? That's her as Miss Suki Sinclair, a TV character that knew very well that the fastest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Earl rubbed his belly. Ain't nothing sexier than that, but I suspect you're leaving something out of your explanation. The dream version of Earl was just as insightful as the real Earl. Dale was leaving something out, and he didn't feel like getting into why he found Miss McCarthy appealing. He responded with what he thought would divert his friend from the truth. She makes me laugh. When do you laugh? I laugh all the damn time. Name one. Dale held up a finger. Remember when we were chasing that headhunting cannibal SOB that ran the Dalmar cult outside of Dallas? Earl started to grin. Oh yeah, he was running to those rubber sandals, hit them stairs, and tripped. Dale let out a laugh as the image re-emerged in his mind. He fell down a whole flight, did the scorpion, and impaled himself on his own goddamn knife. What a dumbass. The two big men, neither of them built for running, had stared at the idiot for a few seconds, then sauntered down the steps and took seats on either side of the murderous, human flesh-eating prick. As the man slowly and painfully bled out, begging and pleading for his life, as most of his victims surely had, Earl and Dale sat comfortably and laughed their enlarged asses off. Good times. Earl wiped his forehead. Funniest damn thing I'd ever seen. Karma's a bitch, Dale said. Okay, Earl said. Back to the $64,000 question. Why are you dreaming us into a blockbuster video store circa 19 I can't remember? If I had any idea, you think I'd keep it from you? You keep all kinds of things from me. True enough. Earl's brow suddenly hardened. Well, maybe this'll jog your damn memory. Earl reached for Dale and grabbed him just under each pit. What the hell? Before Dale could finish, Earl lifted him off the ground and hurled him over a display case. Dale was a good-sized man, and surprised or not, he wasn't easily lifted off the ground and tossed like a football. As he flew through the air, he came to the rapid conclusion that Dream Earl was a bit stronger, and definitely less friendly, than Real Earl. Dale tumbled onto the floor, a display case coming down on top of him. He lay on the dark blue, very earthy-smelling and worn Berber carpet amongst a slew of Brat Pack movies. He kicked the display case up and off him, then rolled, VHS cases cracking underneath him. Earl came around the end cap fast. Dale picked up a copy of The Breakfast Club and hurled it at Earl's face. Just because this is a dream doesn't mean I won't kick your ass. Try it, Earl said. Maybe a good tussle will help you remember why the hell we're here. You really think this is the best way to jog my memory? Dale tried to get up, but slipped on a copy of Some Kind of Wonderful. Shit. He snatched a copy of Sixteen Candles and Ferris Bueller's Day Off and flicked them Earl's way like throwing stars. Earl batted the first one away, but Bueller caught him on the forehead. Will you stop throwing John Hughes movies at me? Fine. Dale grabbed a copy of St. Elmo's Fire and chucked it at Earl's face. 
John Hughes had nothing to do with that one, you jackass. Earl closed on Dale, who was still in a hard-to-defend position, ass down on Berber. Before Earl was in punching distance, another figure approached. Nichelle Nichols looked angry as she hustled over. Earl noticed her and backed off as she drew a sidearm, from where Dale had no idea. I remember this one. Nichelle aimed the OG Star Trek phaser at Dale's face. You used to watch me and say, look at the sweet walking sticks on her. Dale held up a hand. To be fair, my dad would say that. Dale wouldn't necessarily disagree, but didn't think this was a good moment to come clean on that count. But you were thinking it. Thinking and not saying is not a crime, Dale said. Nichols stepped closer, phaser still aimed at Dale's head. This is not set on stun. Now why are we here? Just shoot him, Aaron Gray said, stepping out from behind Nichols. Dale scooted on the carpet. Just hold on a minute, miss. She drew her vintage laser pistol. It's Cornell to you, or perhaps you don't recognize me. She pulled up her blue polo shirt and turned so Dale could see her backside. Is that better? Recognize me now? You've spent decades staring at my ass in syndication. Dale scooted until he felt a display case up against his back. You must admit it's a very shapely uniform. Somebody shoot him! Susan Sarandon said, coming toward him down the aisle. Her bull Durham sultriness and hair had been replaced by a very Thelma and Louise murderous fire. She stopped a few feet away and pointed a finger. You look like the same kind of narcissistic, chauvinistic pig that never rewound your tapes. We're nothing but a collection of holes to creeps like you. Now, why are we here? I swear, Dale said. I always rewound. Susan's right said Ursula Andrus, suddenly appearing next to Sarandon. Her character, Honey Ryder, was both sweet and deadly, but right now she just looked deadly. We're just holes to pigs like him. She leaned toward Dale. And I am so sorry that I'm not here in the bikini you always picture me in. You know how long it took me to convince people that I actually wore clothes? I saw that movie when I was ten. And I'm sorry, but that bikini does leave an impression on a young man. Dale countered with what he knew to be a weak-ass argument. Excuses. She drew her clam knife. Why are we here? Dale spied Earl standing behind the advancing women. Earl, little help? Earl grinned and held up his hands. This is all your messed up psyche, good buddy. I ain't running any part of this show. Now tell these ladies why we're here or it's about to get real ugly. Hey, ton of fun is right. We're going to kick the crap out of you if you don't come clean. Melissa McCarthy said, stepping into Dale's view. What the hell am I doing here? You never lusted after me. You're always leering at Lorelai's ass, which our cameraman, all pigs if you ask me, gave you ample opportunity. Now that's not true. Dale rolled up on one knee. Yes, Ms. Graham does pack well into a tight pair of jeans, but you're a very attractive woman as well. Don't tickle my tits with butterfly kisses. She put one hand on her hip and then snapped her finger with the other. I know. Know what? Dale said, very certain he didn't want to know the answer. I'm not here because you think I'm hot or because of Graham's ass, tits, or holes. I'm here because of who you watched the show with. Velma. That is her name, right? Ha! The ex-wife! Earl said. I knew it! Shut up, Earl! Melissa grabbed her apron and shook it. She would make you dinner, and you both ate it on the couch watching the show. Dale sighed. (sighs) Happier times. She have a thing for Luke or something? No, Kirk, actually. Dale shook his head. I never understood it. Okay, cut this introspective crap shouted a strong female voice from the back of the store. So tell me, you pathetic excuse for a redneck, what the hell am I doing here? An elderly woman, minuscule in stature but not in voice, repeated her words even louder. What the hell am I doing here? Dale stared at Betty White's very petite and pissed-off frame. 
Her blockbuster polo shirt was a bit disheveled, as if she had thrown it on in a hurry. Her name tag read, Manager. She pointed skyward. One minute I'm up there on the beach as that very nice Heath Ledger's rubbing lotion on the parts of my body I told him I can't reach, wink wink, and then suddenly I'm in this ridiculous shirt listening to your dumbass. She gestured to the other ladies. Why the hell am I here with this collection of celebrity holes? Hey, McCarthy said. Watch it, Aunt B. I'm not above smacking an old lady. Oh, I'm so scared. Betty White rolled her eyes as Dale got up on the other knee. Can we please stop saying the word holes? Dale said, turning to Miss White. Miss White, please trust me when I say I have no goddamn idea why you're here. White pointed at Dale. Will somebody please shoot him? Instead of shooting him, all the women began to chant in unison, including White. Why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we here? Are we here? Dale awoke with a start and shouted, What the crusty hell? His hands were curled into fists, and his eyes were so wide they felt as if they get stuck in a perpetual state of confused terror. Stepping up and in, Earl shut the door of the cab. That must have been a doozy. Looks like someone grabbed a fistful of your short and curlies and dragged you to church. Bad dream? Not sure if it was a dream or an intervention. Intervention? That's like therapy or something. A little. Well, did you learn anything useful? Your ability to recognize John Hughes movies thrown at your head is pretty impressive. What? Dale shook his head. Never mind. He looked at Earl's half-eaten breakfast burrito and coffee. Where's mine? You get your own damn breakfast, Earl snapped. You're the reason I missed mine in the first place. There was a momentary confusion, but then the early morning activities flooded back, like a program loading into an old, lethargic word processor. They'd gotten an early start, finished running a load of off-brand Sony replacement parts east, and were planning on taking a look at some repossessed trailers Miss Williams had found online on the rebound trip. The plan was to load up with caffeine and carbs at a Waffle House in Abilene, then fuel up and hit the road. They had just sent their breakfast order to the kitchen when Dale noticed a backward ball cap wearing asshole grab the backside of a waitress. From the other side of the establishment, Dale, in a somewhat friendly but direct tone, told backwards ball cap that he'd crossed the line and advised him not to do it again. Dale also outlined in colorful language what would happen to him if he did not heed this friendly advice. Backward ball cap, heavy set but muscular, and his bearded, single browed friend suggested to Dale that he mind his own business and not get his silk undergarments into a distressing and or uncomfortable position. Dale did not take to that too well and gave both men a hard stare. He then suggested that their dissatisfaction about their undersized manhood should not be taken out on the establishment's hard-working staff. Dale followed that suggestion with another one that encouraged the two men to go find some place where they could stimulate each other's aforementioned undersized manhoods until satisfaction could be seen on their illiterate and inbred faces. He said this all with a smile. It was at that point that a middle-aged mother of two little ones at the next table asked Dale to please watch his language. I do apologize, ma'am, Dale had said. He then got up, walked toward the door, and with a well-aimed glare, he dared the other two men to follow. Those two idiots followed you outside, Earl said, having recounted the event in much more colorful language. And for some strange reason, they kept smashing their faces into your fists. Then someone shouted for the police. Next thing I knew, I missed breakfast. Earl pointed at Dale with his burrito. Your fault. Dale grinned and looked down at his hands. They had to leave in a hurry and he hadn't had time to wash the blood from his knuckles. And there's the part that pisses me off the most, Earl continued. As we're making our getaway, you do what you always do after a good tussle. Which is? You take a nap, Earl said. I swear, good buddy, fighting's like sex to you, and vice versa, which does shed some light on your relationships, which always looks like a cobra and a mongoose doing the mambo. I'm sensing you're irritated. I am fifty shades of irritated, Earl shouted. 
You interrupted a man's breakfast! Dale shook his head. That ain't it. And you didn't even let me hit either one of them ass-grabbing idiots! Dale pointed a finger. There it is. I'm just saying there were two of them. You could have shared. So you go get your own damn breakfast. Fine, Dale said. Where'd you get that? Earl took a bite, and as he chewed, he said, Round the corner, two or so shops down on the other side of the street. Earl swallowed. Nice little mom and pop kind of place, very small town friendly. Cashier's named Consuela, pretty brown eyes and a nice caboose. Huh, Dale said, then hopped out and looked back at his friend. About to take another bite, Earl stopped, clearly noticing his friend staring at him. What? You ever think we get too wrapped up in sexualizing women, seeing them as only a collection of attractive holes and parts, thereby becoming blind to who they really are, allowing their real beauty, their inner beauty, to go unnoticed? Earl turned to face him. I swear, sometimes you say things that make me want to pick you up and throw you across the room. Dale raised an eyebrow. Interesting. Is it? Earl said. I think you're still dreaming. Dale shrugged. Probably. He shut the door and headed for the corner. As he walked, his friend's words, specifically references to tossing him across the room, resonated, as did the violent intervention that had recently taken place in his unconscious. He never believed he was the kind of man who thought of women as a collection of attractive holes. Pretty sure, anyway. The mix of violent memories and conflict that made its home in Dale's mind had produced many disturbing dreams, but on occasion, what occurred in his head was more than just nocturnal imaginings. Just before he turned the corner, he started to get the unsettling feeling that this dream was such a dream. Something was reaching out from the darkness, trying to tell him... What? In the past, he'd never quite figured it all out before whatever it was smacked him upside the head turning the corner, he immediately realized he didn't need a smack to get some insight on this one. He just needed to look for the sign, a sign that told him he was in the right place. The sign he saw, less than a hundred yards down a desperately in-need-of-repair street, lined by half-occupied brick single-story buildings, was as clear as day. Rising above an abandoned establishment that did not blend in with the other structures on a part of the street that the city had clearly decided was no longer worthy of maintenance, stood a faded, broken, blue and yellow sign shaped like a movie ticket. It displayed two words in all caps. Blockbuster Video. Dale stopped and took in a deep breath. When he let it out, he had two words of his own. Well, shit... Twenty minutes, one breakfast burrito and a coffee later, Dale sat back in the passenger seat of Earl's Peterbilt cab. They were still resting on a street in the small town in West Texas around the corner from a row of somewhat derelict buildings. Sitting at the end of that row of derelict buildings, like the end punctuation on a badly written sentence, was the remnants of what used to be a blockbuster video. Earl sat behind the wheel, the remains of his second breakfast burrito in one hand, his smartphone in the other. Ms. Williams' voice piped through the tiny speaker, and even though e and ds office manager was a thousand miles away, she resonated as if there, in the cab, able to smell the bacon in Earl's burrito. The Blockbuster store wasn't closed for the reasons you'd think, Ms. Williams said. Apparently the building was condemned in the early 2000s, and some of the surrounding structures were considered unsafe. The business moved over one town, and it closed a few years later when the video rental business went belly up. Why the building get condemned? Earl said. The articles I found disagree on that. Miss Williams continued. Some pointed the finger at hydraulic fracturing, which was blamed for several sinkholes in the area. Sinkholes, Dale said, more to himself than anyone in earshot. Earl glanced over at Dale. Sinkholes. They're like big openings in the earth. You never know when... I know what a sinkhole is, Dale interrupted. It's just that I've heard the word holes an exorbitant number of times today. Earl's forehead scrunched up like he was working on an algebra problem in Latin. Ms. Williams, Dale said. Anything else to add? 
just that the town seized possession of the buildings and has no plans to tear them down or renovate. Makes sense, Earl said. They ain't hurting nothing out here. Not like this is prime real estate. If there is nothing else, I gotta get Cassie to school, Miss Williams said. As always, thank you for going above and beyond, Dale said. I'll remind you that you said that at Christmas bonus time. Earl smiled. Bye. He hit the red button and put the phone away. Ever notice how she never asks any questions? I swear we could ask her where the best place to bury a body is on the way to Tulsa, and she'd come back in five minutes with nothing but a very useful list of locations. No questions asked. Dale shrugged. I suspect she doesn't want to know too much about the nonsense we find ourselves in. Smart lady, Earl said. Dale opened the cab door and stepped out, closing it behind him. Earl joined him at the truck's grill, and they both headed out, armed with their favorite blades. In regards to the current nonsense, you want to tell me why we're getting ready to break into an abandoned blockbuster video? As nostalgic as that might seem, it was not on our flight plan. Dale didn't have a specific answer, or any kind of answer, really, but he did have a question. Why did you stop here? They turned the corner onto the street with the derelict buildings. Do I need to recount our breakfast fiasco again? Earl said. No, I mean, why did you pull off the highway here? There must have been a dozen places to stop, but you pulled off at this particular exit, leading to this particular one-stop sign town. I drove as long as I could. Then my stomach started growling so loud I couldn't hear Waylon Jennings wailing on the radio. Nice wordplay. Dale glanced over at his friend. So we're following your stomach now? And the billboard. What billboard? Quarter mile before the exit to this town is a big old sign advertising our breakfast burrito place. There's a waitress on it, not Consuela, younger, holding a tray full of eats and turned sideways like in them superhero movie posters, looking back over her caboose. Is that all we think about, our stomachs and cabooses? Well, in that particular moment, right before I put on the turn signal, yeah. Dale shook his head. Not sure why women give us the time of day. It's a shame what happened to the billboard. What? Oh, some midget put several buckshots into it. Things full of holes. Dale cast his gaze skyward toward the powers that be. Jeez, beat a metaphor to death much? As they moved side by side down the middle of a deserted street, Earl said, All right, it's your turn. Why are we doing this? Well, while I was enjoying my post-tussle nap, I had a very vivid dream. Yes, you did mention that. Was I in it? Dale took a deep breath. Yes. And what were we doing? Picking out a movie to rent at... Dale pointed to their destination. Earl's pace slowed, almost coming to a stop. No shit. No shit. As they passed... Dale peered into the window of their breakfast burrito shop. Consuelo was on her landline staring back at Dale. The look on her face didn't seem as friendly as before. Don't suppose it's just a coincidence? Earl quick-stepped to catch up with Dale. I spec not, Dale said. Out of curiosity, what movie we pick? Well, I don't think it's relevant, but it was a choice between Adventures in the Nakatomi Tower and Dale Arden. Oh, I hope we went with Arden, Earl said. Just not the right time of year for a Christmas movie. On that, we can agree. They arrived at the store. Several of the sun-scorched windows were covered in well-worn pieces of plywood, and strips were peeling back like aged wallpaper. Dale found a spot between the wood that allowed him access to the glass. He ran his fingers over it, feeling the heat-induced waves. Heat resonated from its surface, and he couldn't keep his fingers on the glass too long. Must be hotter than hell in there. He attempted to peer through the discolored, sun-bleached, murky glass, but it was like trying to spot a minnow in a filthy aquarium. Dale moved over to the main entrance. Unlike the windows, it was not covered, and there didn't seem to be as much dust and general neglect as the rest of the outside. A sun-baked condemned notice was taped to the inside, and just underneath was a black and white sign that said, Sorry, we are closed. Please come again. 
Dale tapped the keyhole to the deadbolt, which seemed to be the only thing keeping the door secure. You're up. Earl pulled a small suede wrap from his vest and unrolled his lock picking kit. He pulled out a hook pick and went to work on the lock. I suppose you notice the eyeballs on us. Earl tilted his head at a fairly modern surveillance camera mounted on the roof's overhang, its lens aimed at the door. Dale hadn't, but was certainly appreciative that his friend did. Earl always found a way to remind him that his friend was not just good company. Between the surveillance and whoever Consuela called, it was a pretty good guess that at some point someone was going to crash their little breaking and entering party. You think anyone's monitoring those cameras? Earl said as he swapped his hook pick for a half diamond pick. We'll be the first to find out. Earl rolled his eyes and he continued his work. Since there's a fair chance we'll be spending the night in jail, is there anything you can tell me about what we're walking into? Not really. The deadbolt slid back with a thunk. What about this dream? Besides movie hunting, what else happened? Uh... Dale flashed through the very vivid dream, celebrity women attacking him, accusing him of being a misogynistic pig pointing movie prop weapons at him, exposing a happy memory from his days as a married man, and demanding to know why they were there. Mm, nothing comes to mind, Dale said. Uh-huh. Earl opened the door. I spec you're leaving things out. Dale started to go in, but stopped and looked at his friend. Except... Except what? Do you think Betty White was attractive? Earl looked back at Dale, more confused than a 90-year-old scrolling through TikTok. I take it that's a no, Dale said, then stepped inside. Behind him, Earl said, What the hell happened in that dream? With Earl as his shadow, the two moved into the store. Several things hit them straight away. Beside the wave of heat, which Dale figured was about 90 degrees, give or take, there was another sensation that blew through them like mustard gas. The smell was old, stale, and not at all unexpected. What they didn't expect was the stench of blood and old meat, like an open wound festering. Dale brought up a hand over his nose as Earl said, That's the kind of smell make one lose their appetite. So is your cologne, Dale said. Keep your eyes peeled. Even though the windows were covered and sun-scorched, enough light found its way to paint the scene. Not being hermetically sealed, there was a bit of weathering on the store's interior. Dust and the kind of discoloration that only time can bring was everywhere. The dozen or more display cases created a sectional system of aisles, dividing the store into genres. They seemed to have entered the general family-friendly section, with lots of Disney movies and the like. Although it didn't seem necessary, the Power Rangers had an entire shelf. The video boxes and a few DVD cases were sitting on their shelves as if the staff had just closed for the evening, locked the doors, and just never came back. They moved around the edge of the store, staying punching distance from the windows. Any idea what we're looking for? Earl said. Dale stopped in front of a life-size cardboard cutout advertisement for the movie Miss Congeniality 2, Armed and Dangerous. Miss Bullock's dust-covered smile seemed to be smirking at Dale. I spec we'll know it when we see it. How about that door? Earl gestured toward the back. On the far wall was a door that seemed out of place. It had a very modern or even futuristic look about it, complete with a strange-looking control pad on the right side. Could have been a keypad or LED screen, but it was too far away to tell. Whatever its function, it was clearly a post-gone-out-of-business edition that didn't make much sense, like hooking up a new trailer to a truck that hadn't run in 20 years. I'm not a betting man, Dale said, but the odds seem to indicate that what we're looking for is on the other side of that door. Already imagining what kind of force it was going to take to get through, Dale took a big step in the door's direction. As he took his second step, Earl's hand seized his shoulder. Whoa, partner. Dale whirled around. What? Earl's gaze cast down by Dale's feet. You are about to take an unhealthy trip. 
Dale looked at his boots and instinctively took a step back. Shit! From a respectful distance, the two men took a knee at the edge of a hole in the floor. It was half a carton of smokes wider than a manhole. Good looking out, Dale said. You're all kinds of observant this morning. I do have my uses, Earl said. What do you think? Sinkhole? Dale examined the edges. They were jagged and torn. The carpet around the circumference was shredded. No clean cuts, and the foundation, 18 inches of cement, was jagged with sections that had claw marks. Below the opening was darkness. I'm not a sinkhole expert, but this seems a mite small. Earl nodded. Thinking the same thing. Maybe there's a basement. He pulled out his smartphone and shined a light down. After 20 feet, the light faded into blackness, revealing nothing but dust particles floating in the light. No basement. Earl shone his light up the aisle they were parked on. There's another one. Dale followed the beam and saw it, 20 feet away. Jeez. They both stood. Watch your step. No telling how many there are. Earl shone the light in Dale's face. I'm not the one who nearly took a step too far. That's fair, Dale shrugged. If they're not sinkholes, does that mean someone put them here? Earl said. If they did, wonder what for? Dale was wondering along the same lines, and as usual, his dream was still keeping its secrets. Earl suddenly turned to the main entrance and clicked off his light. Suppose we could ask these fellers... Dale gazed back and saw what was speeding their way. God damn it. Let me do the talking, Earl said. Why? You've done nothing but piss people off this morning, me included, Earl said. And I'd like to stay out of lockup and an orange onesie. Dale shrugged. Suit yourself. Do your thing. Dale couldn't deny that not only had Earl saved his life on occasion, but he'd kept the pair from having to watch the sunset from the clink now and again. Dale never worried too much about being locked up. Because of who he had once been, he was never held for too long. To Dale, getting locked up was mostly a nuisance, and darn right inconvenient at times. Since they hadn't come close to doing whatever it was they were here to do, getting locked up now would definitely be inconvenient. As they moved back to the entrance, Dale got another whiff of rot. Something had died and wasn't quite at the sun-baked, odorless jerky stage yet. It was still glistening and meaty. Out of curiosity, Dale said. What excuse are you going with? Well, how about this? Earl said. See, officer, I was out for a stroll and saw this box of kittens inside this here abandoned building, looking cute and needing rescuing. Why didn't you just give a holler to the authorities or some animal shelter, something like that? Left my phone in the truck. I can see it in your back pocket, Dale said. Earl sighed. Fine, I just didn't want to bother nobody is all. Thought I'd handle it by my lonesome, not cause a fuss. Okay, Dale said as they arrived at the front door. At some point, aren't you going to have to produce a box of kittens? You're overcomplicating my narrative with details, Earl snapped. Now shush. As their self-appointed spokesperson, Earl stepped ahead and opened the door. Standing just behind his friend, Dale got an unsettling feeling, like when a ceiling fan suddenly stops and the air becomes stale, stagnant. Dale eyed the single sheriff's car parked about 20 feet from the propped open glass door. The two men inside hadn't gotten out. They were just sitting there, like obedient guard dogs waiting for their next command. Based on the sound of their approach, they had come at a high rate of speed and skidded to a stop. There seemed to be a lot of urgency in their arrival, but now the two officers just sat there, staring. Through a spotless windshield, Dale saw that the two men wore matching reflective sunglasses and had matching facial hair unnecessarily thick mustaches that seemed to belong in another decade. What is it with cops and mustaches? Dale looked behind them into the vehicle and realized he couldn't. 
Dale had done his time in the backseat of police cars, and besides the variety of interior colors, they all had similar characteristics. They all had no handle on the inside of the doors, and there was a heavy wire divider separating the front seat from the back. This one did not have wire. It had a dark, non-see-through barrier allowing the rear compartment to keep its secrets. The heavily tinted or painted black windows on the rear side windows seemed to add to the mystery. None of this felt right. Earl was about to step through the entrance when Dale put a hand on his shoulder. Hold up. His friend protested but stopped in the doorway. I said I'd do the talking. Earl smiled and raised his hands. Neither cop had yet moved, and Dale suspected that they were not here to talk. When one of them finally did move, Dale was convinced of it. In the front passenger seat, Dale noticed the officer's outside shoulder hunch up ever so slightly. In Dale's mind, the cop had just unsnapped his holster guard, and he either was too stupid to know what kind of message that gesture sent, or he thought Dale was too stupid to notice. Either way, the officer was dead wrong. In an explosion of energy, both car doors flew open. A split second later, Dale wrenched Earl backward. Pulling Earl's body in a direction without Earl's help was no small task, and Dale felt a muscle tear in his shoulder. Dale pushed Earl's big head down as bullets pierced the doorway. The two large men hit the ground and rolled behind cover as the sound of angry gunfire boomed from outside. See what happens when I let you do the talking? Earl rolled onto his belly. I didn't say a damn thing! They probably don't like your aftershave. Ain't wearing any. Earl sat up as a volley of three shots took out the action sign above his head. Sides, I don't think they's in the mood to talk. Really? Dale said. What gave it away? I'm smarter than I look. Good thing. Earl peeked around the wooden display case. We got one going around back with a 12 gauge. Our front gate crasher has a Glock 17 or 19. Indiscriminate bullets zipped through the store. And apparently plenty of bullets. Earl took a fast second peek. He stopped at the entrance. Dale knew a couple of things. If it were a Glock, it was probably a 17. No self-respecting Texas lawman with a 1970s style mustache would be caught dead carrying a Glock 19. The 19 was dainty and didn't have the right amount of southern bravado. Dale also knew the officer wasn't hesitating to come in because he was shy. He was giving his partner the time to get into position. Dale figured they had 15 seconds before they put the squeeze on him. Time enough for an inventory check. Hey, besides your good looks, what do you got? Earl patted Betsy, then checked the underarm rig that carried up to six throwing knives, three on each side. Both Dale and Earl were disappointed to see that he had two empty spots on his right side. Damn, the other day I picked grease out of my nails with one, and I picked some gristle from my teeth with another. Must have forgot to put them back. Your poor grooming habits are awful inconvenient at times, Dale said. With a machete slung up on Dale's back and Earl's less than full blade count, they were definitely at a disadvantage against a shotgun and a Glock. I guess somebody was monitoring those cameras, Earl said. Or Consuela called these yahoos. If she did, I'm gonna go get my tip back. We need a plan, Dale said. Why don't we distract him, get him moving in the same direction, and then we double back and put the squeeze on him in the middle? Earl shook his head. Too complicated. You lost me at double back. How's that complicated? You're always overthinking and overcomplicating. Okay, what's your plan? Earl cocked his head. Which one would you rather get shot by? Neither, Dale almost shouted. Fine, I'll pick. Earl got up, looking as if he were about to take off. I'll deal with 12 gauge. You take Mr. Glock's 17 or 19. That's the play? Man-to-man -man coverage? On three. Ready? Not especially, but... Dale jumped up on his haunches. Say the word. Hut one. Earl started the count. Hut two. Dale continued. Move your ass! Both men took off, running low and fast. 
Dale had no idea what Earl's plan was for dealing with Officer 12 Gage, but since he had made a beeline for the wall, he guessed his friend was going to try and hug the outskirts of the building looking for the cop's point of entry. Maybe surprise him. Dale's plan wasn't that different. Surprise was a big factor. When anyone is fired upon, the first point of order is to return fire. If that isn't possible, and it wasn't since Dale was only armed with a machete and his good looks, then the next point of order would be to move away, retreat, and find a place most likely to keep oneself from getting shot. The mustache-endowed cop with the Glock would most definitely know this and believe Dale was scurrying as far away as possible, like a smart person. Dale was going to do the opposite, try to get as close as possible. If he was lucky, maybe he'd only get shot once or twice before getting his hands on him. If he was unlucky, well, he'd had a good ride. Not great, but good. Using the skills acquired in a previous life, he moved silently. He didn't take a breath or execute any unneeded movement. Any slight noise, anything that might draw attention, might get him shot. Stepping around VHS boxes littering the floor, he made it to the first aisle in the store only six feet from the main entrance. The mid-morning sun was in an ideal position to cast the cop's shadow through the entryway, giving Dale a decent facsimile of his opponent's movement. The cop had just slapped a new cartridge into the Glock, his third thus far, and judging by his shadow, he had stepped inside the store. There was a crash from somewhere in the back, wood and glass breaking. Then the 12 gauge went off. Dale hoped Earl was not on the unfriendly side of the blast. The cop near Dale began moving toward the shot. In a second, he would be at the end of the aisle, able to see Dale. Grabbing a handful of DVD cases, he tossed them like flat rocks across the surface of a pond. The plastic cases skipped over the carpet, passing in front of the cop. As luck would have it, the cop's right foot came down on one, causing him to slide for a moment. Dale burst from the aisle like a Mack truck going downhill, his hands outstretched, one targeting the Glock and the other the cop's neck. Ten years ago, Dale might have gotten to him before the young cop regained his balance, but not today. As Dale reached him, the cop spun, aiming the gun at Dale's face. Shock and surprise emanated from the cop's big, wide eyes, causing him to hesitate before pulling the trigger. It was just enough time for Dale to move his head away from the barrel and seize one of the cop's shoulders. A blink of an eye later, the cop fired. The explosion rang in Dale's ear, and the bullet grazed a well-fed cheek. Anger pulsed through Dale as he got a hold of the gun. He twisted it inward so hard and fast that Dale could hear the man's thumb snap over the ringing in his ear. Taking away the man's gun did not reduce Dale's anger, not by a long shot. This cop, sworn to protect and serve, just tried to shoot him in the face. Dale turned the Glock around and put the muzzle up against his chest and looked into the man's eyes. Fear radiated from the man's quivering features like a wounded feline cornered by a very pissed-off dog. I... I have a son, the cop said. Dale narrowed his eyes. So do I, asshole. Then he pulled the trigger. Twice. The man fell back onto the faded carpet, coughing up blood. There was no blood on his chest. His Kevlar vest prevented the bullets from killing him, but Dale was satisfied that it hurt like hell. The cop's face became a raging river of anguish and pain. He writhed on the floor, clutching his chest and spitting up blood. Feeling nothing for the man's pain, Dale rolled him over onto his stomach and used his own cuffs to secure his hands behind his back. A silver chain around his neck, with something long and shiny, slid across his back. Their tussle must have caused the necklace to flip to his backside. Dale grabbed the long metal piece and turned it over in his hand. Looked like a duck call, but thinner. Probably a dog whistle. This murdering cop might work with a police dog if a town as small as this had a canine unit. Dale was about to check his utility belt for zip ties to secure his feet, but another shot from the 12 gauge, followed by a scream, rang out from the back. Shit! Earl!
You've been listening to Blood, Holes, and Videotape Part 1 by Kevin David Anderson. Besides being the creator of Earl and Dale, the Midnight Men, Kevin David Anderson has penned stories in over a hundred publications. His debut novel, Night of the Living Trekkies, was named one of the top five zombie novels of 2010 by the Washington Post. His latest book, Night Sounds, from podcast to print, features many of Kevin's stories heard right here on the Horror Hill podcast and many others such as the No Sleep podcast, Pseudopod, The Drabblecast, and Otis Gyrie's Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Night Sounds also features an introduction by Jason Hill, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you'd like to meet Kevin, he'll be hanging out at StokerCon in San Diego and selling his books at Midsummer Scream in Long Beach this summer. Well, listeners, I know what you're thinking. Seriously? You're seriously ending the episode there? That's right. I am. But don't worry, we'll be finishing up Dale and Earl's adventure next week. In the meantime, if you'd like to peruse some of their earlier adventures, my predecessor, Jason Hill, covered several of them in earlier seasons of Horror Hill. Grab a pen if you'd like to make some notes. Rotten to the Core was featured in Season 2, Episode 15, Tangled Webs in Season 3, Episode 5, Werewolf School in Season 3, Episode 24 to Season 4, Episode 1, All Trucked Up in Season 4, Episodes 11 and 12, and The Art of the Diesel in Season 5, Episodes 3 and 4. There, that should keep you busy for a while. Thanks again to Kevin David Anderson for this story, and also to Olivia Steele for her amazing voice work. Be sure to tune in next week as we conclude Earl and Dale's adventure, and until then, friends, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's fear from the heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you are after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.